Okay, it's lovely. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Great to see you all. Thank you for coming out on these cold, dark evenings. I think that's ever so romantic. Some of you husbands telling your wives, wives tonight, well, you're out for a real treat, a, a real feast. There we are. Hope and pray so. I was chatting to someone um, during the week and uh, they were saying about the Isaiah and uh, particularly we focused on the first half, which of course has been all judgment. And uh, they didn't really say it was gloomy, but that was it, you know, there's a lot of gloom because the people have rejected the Holy One of Israel. They're not holy in the way they conduct their lives. They don't see God as different. In actual fact, they're spending an awful lot of time worshiping other gods. And so God says, judgment is going to come unless you get things sorted out. But uh, this person commented that then we got onto the fact that there was a remnant, there was a group of people who would always remain faithful, and that God also remains faithful, and uh, that God is about to save his people as well. Even though they go away from him, he has got this uh, process of salvation. And so, right towards the end of last week, I started getting into the second half of Isaiah, and I'm going to concentrate mainly there um, tonight. And in this second half of Isaiah, it is a much more positive uh, message. Uh, one of the things that I covered very, very quickly, it's full of comfort for the exiles. All of a sudden, Isaiah, instead of talking about what was going to happen when the Assyrians were attacking in uh, the north, when they were attacking Israel, and he looked even beyond when the Babylonians would attack the south and take the people away into exile, he says that even at the end of the exile, there is hope. And uh, so I mentioned, you know, five things in this part, that there's consolation. The very first word when we come into chapter 40 is comfort comfort my people all right you sin your judgment it's past there's a new era that started it's a time of encouragement fear not i have redeemed you those covenant promises still hold i've chosen you uh, and i that word redeem i'm going to spend a little bit of time looking at that tonight as well there's forgiveness and again, if you look at the notes from last week, there's a whole number of verses that talk about, you know, though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. Um, I, even I, who blots out your transgressions, talks about Jesus being wounded for our iniquities. These words that you don't tend to associate with the Old Testament, more of a New Testament message. There's going to be victory because the Babylonians will be defeated. I was reading from um, chapter 47. I was encouraging people to read things out loud where Babylon, who's seen as this queen, is dragged down into the dirt um, um, because God is going to judge Babylon. Even though he can use Babylon and Assyria as his tools, he is still a God of righteousness and he will bring judgment on them as well. And eventually they are going to be restored uh, leave Babylon, get ready to flee from Babylon, you're going back home. So that's one of the three sort of areas that I want to look at tonight, just regarding Isaiah. And then I will say a little bit about the way in which the book was written. The second one was the majesty of God. And uh, I think the la oh, oh, and then we will look at the suffering servant uh, as well. But the majesty of God, and I think the last... Uh, slide that I showed was this one and I'm going to have a look at that in a minute and for homework I asked uh, if you could just write down some of the titles of God do you remember what I've always said about when you read the Bible sometimes it's good to have a goal and actually you can read a whole pile of chapters very very quickly if you've got something that you're looking at so I'm just wondering if anyone had anything that they wanted to offer Okay, moving on. <laughs> okay, I tell you what, let me, let me just go back to chapter 40. And uh, again, I just want to remark on, about the fact that sometimes it helps us to read things carefully. I think it's so easy just to read that chapter for today, go through it, and your brain isn't engaged. But when Isaiah is talking about God here, in chapter 40, this is what he says in verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Now, I wonder if you've ever stopped and thought, what does that mean to measure waters in the hollow of his hand? Do you ever remember putting your hand under maybe a leaky drain pipe and the drops go in and you gather water in the palm of your hand? It says, for God, 
he's measured the waters, all the waters on the earth, they're just like a handful to God. And I just find that amazing. When you stop and you think about that, uh, I'm not a very good swimmer. Uh, my son Tim, from about the age of eight, could beat me at swimming. In fact, he'd say, I'll race you to the end, Dad. And then he'd slow down deliberately till I was almost there. And then he'd say, oh, I'll beat you again, you know. <laughs> no, I'm a, uh, but uh, he was very good. I'm not a very good swimmer. I remember taking some students um, across. We used to enjoy going over to Northern Ireland, have, having, uh, going over to Northern Ireland for a weekend and speaking in churches over there. And uh, there was the Stranralan Ferry. Now, if you look on a map, you know, it's, it's a tiny bit of water. But you eventually get to a place where you can't see Scotland and you can't see Ireland. And all you can see is water. And I, because I can't swim, I'm looking over the side of the boat and think, God, this is really quite scary. If I fell in, I wouldn't have a chance. And that's a tiny bit of water. But I love that the Bible says, you know, for God, all the oceans, they're just like something that can be held, hand, held in his hand. It says, or oh, with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens. You know when sometimes people measure things? How many hands widths or something like that? How many hand spans? All the scientists tell us the size of our galaxy is trillions of light years. A light year is how, how far you can get, how far light travels in a year. And light travels at 186,000 miles in a second. So this just blows your mind. And yet God says, okay, that's mine. I can deal with that. It's just like a hand span to me. Um, a bit later on uh, in verse 15, surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. I don't know if you've ever emptied a bucket and there's always a drop left at the bottom. You know, it's really hard. you've got to get that last drop out. And uh, it's this insignificant bit, but all the nations Mighty Babylon, mighty Assyria, mighty China, mighty Russia, mighty America, India, all these, a drop in the bucket. They're regarded as dust on the scales. So you know if you're cooking and you've got to weigh something out or something and you need eight ounces of plain flour. Uh, I wonder how many of you dust the scales. For, I know we've got electric ones now, but whether you dust them, you don't because it's insignificant. And all of these things, and I, I just really want to encourage you, particularly in this bit of Isaiah, to read it carefully and think about some of the images, because I think it says lots of wonderful things about God. Some of the titles of God, I've got some of them here. He's a saviour. Again, that's, we, we tend to think of that as more a New Testament idea. A redeemer. I'll say more about that in a minute. He's a shepherd. He's the first and the last. He's the king. He's a husband. Okay, uh, we're familiar, I would hope, with the idea that we are the bride of Christ. Je Jesus is the husband, he's the groom, the church is the bride of Christ. But in the Old Testament, God says, your maker, your creator, he's your husband. He's going to look after you. And he is, as I said, the holy one of Israel. That image, that, um, uh, that, that uh, vision that Isaiah had in the, at the beginning, the holy one. The one who is different, the one who is moral, the one who is pure. So, as I said, I just want to go on about this idea of redeemer. And I would imagine, how, how many of you have heard of the word kinsman redeemer in the Old Testament? Yeah, quite a lot, a lot of you are nodding, particularly to do with the book of Ruth. And actually, the word that is translated redeemer here in Isaiah, it's exactly the same as this idea of a kinsman redeemer. And... Uh, this whole idea of redemption, that crops up a lot, as well as the, the actual term redeemer, the verb to redeem. God says, I will redeem you. Uh, and as I said, in order to understand this, particularly in the Old Testament context, it's interesting to look at what the word really means. And really it's in Ruth we get this idea of someone who's called a kinsman redeemer. Now that is a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? You know, it doesn't really mean much to us. Probably we don't use the word redeem that much. We don't use the word kinsman. And so there are some versions and they talk about the family protector. And I think that's, you know, a good way of putting it in modern parlance. And the word to redeem in Hebrew, it's ga'al, 
Uh, the redeemer is goel. You know, you can see that those terms are, are very uh, similar. And the idea is this of fulfilling your responsibility towards your relatives. All right. So don't forget in those days, and, and you know, sadly, nowadays, you know, sometimes families they've broken down so much. But in those days, you probably have three or four generations all living in the same vicinity in the tent. You know, so the great grandparents, grandparents parents and the children, uh, everyone knew their genealogy, everyone knew what tribe they belonged to, what clan they belonged to, and uh, that, that was very important. And uh, I, I won't look up all of uh, these verses or go through them all, but you can you, uh, look at these uh, yourself. One of the things that uh, you had responsibility for was that if one of your relatives became enslaved, it was your responsibility to buy them out of slavery. All right, very different culture from what we're living in, but for various reasons, people could be enslaved. Uh, but the kinsman, the family protector, the nearest relative, might be a father, might be an uncle, might be a cousin, might be a brother. It tended to be the men, because in those days it was more the men who had uh, responsibility for business and money, uh, was the, the women were the, the homemakers, if you like. Um, also, this again might seem strange, if someone from your clan was deliberately murdered without reason by someone else, it was your responsibility to avenge that person. Don't forget in those days, Israel didn't have a police force, all right? They had armies when they would fight against others, but how, did you, how do you administer justice? And it was on, um, it was the, the, the responsibility of a, a member from the family to uphold the family honor and bring about uh, proper vengeance, proper justice, if you, if you like. Um, there is a responsibility of buying back someone's land. I was just mentioning about Ruth. In actual fact, years ago, you know, uh, I, I did go through uh, the book of Ruth, some of you might remember, uh, that right towards the end in Ruth chapter four, Boaz wants to redeem the land of Naomi who's the mother of Ruth, of course. There actually is a nearer kinsman, someone who's got first claim, and there's a, a little bit of an episode, but eventually the person says, oh, I don't want the land, you have it, and uh, he, he gets the land and he marries uh, Ruth, of course. But again, this idea of land being something that just could be sold or transferred, it wasn't part of the Hebrew mindset. Um, the idea was that the land belonged to God. I'm giving you this promised land. I'm in charge of it. You've all got your family plot. That should stay within the family and ultimately belongs to God. Some of you might have heard of the year of Jubilee when debts had to be canceled, land had to be given back to the original family, ideally. It, we don't know whether or not it always sort of happened, but land ultimately belonged to God. Now, there were times when people had to sell it because they got in trouble, or sometimes they had their land taken away. But again, the responsibility of the redeemer, the kinsman redeemer, was to get the land back. So I've got a brother called John. If he lost his bit of land and I could afford to buy it back, that would be my responsibility. And he would have the same responsibility for me. So all of these things are caught up with this idea of the kinsman redeemer. But actually, I want to say they're all caught up with the idea of the redeemer as well. Because in this book, we find, in Isaiah, in the second part of Isaiah, we find that, as I just mentioned, God is saying, I'm in relationship with you. I'm your husband. You know, this is the closest possible relationship. The two will become one. So I am going to take on my responsibilities because I am your kinsman. I have got a responsibility. And one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to rescue you from slavery. Now, we know that's true in a political sense because God's going to come and rescue them from Babylon where they're in exile. But we also know, and we'll see more about this when we talk about the suffering servant, I'm going to redeem you in a spiritual sense, because it's not just the political, it's that spiritual estrangement from God, that God is going to do something about that and make sure that that is sorted out. In order to do it, there's sometimes the payment of a ransom. Uh, can I say there's an odd little reference in chapter 43 where God's talking about Cyrus and uh, what Cyrus is going to do. And he said, I've given you Ethiopia 
and uh, Egypt and Cush um, and Seba as a ransom, and it is, it's very difficult to try and understand, and sometimes people look at this, but it seems as though what God, God is saying, look Cyrus, I'm gonna let you beat not only the Babylonians, but you'll be able to get down into Egypt. Because actually, Cyrus didn't really have any motive for, for doing any more than just defeated the Babylonians. He certainly didn't need to let the Israelites go, to go back to their land, you know, he, he had plenty of land and everything. But on his way down, to defeat in the Egyptians, although he doesn't defeat the Egyptians himself, his son Cambyses does, he takes that land. So just in case anyone ever comes up against that and thinks, oh golly, that's jolly odd, what on earth does that mean? It seems that God's saying, you're, you, you're involved in this act of salvation, I'm giving you extra, I'm sort of paying you uh, in that sense. Of course, the real price that is paid is in Isaiah 53. He's wounded, he's bruised, he's crushed for our iniquities, for our sins. He restores the land. So just as, remember, Naomi's family had lost the land, they needed to get it back. The Jews have lost their land, but God has given them their land back. He's releasing the captives. You know, they have not been totally independent. They have been subject to the Babylonians, but they are going to release, be released. But God is also going to bring justice and vengeance on the Babylonians. So I just want to say that word redeemer, you know, sometimes we just think, oh yeah, he's redeemed us, he saved us. But I just love the way that you've got all these things that he's related to us. He takes the responsibility, he brings people back to their lands, he releases them from, from captivity, and he deals with the, the enemy as well. Talking again just about the majesty of God, there's one verse, and I, I, I really like this in uh, Isaiah chapter 40. And I just got down here, it talks about the sovereignty of God. Just four lines. The Lord is the everlasting God. He is eternal. The creator of the ends of the earth. He's omnipresent. Right? He is everywhere, from one end of the earth, in fact, one end of the, <laughs> the universe to the other end of the universe. He will not grow tired or weary. He is omnipotent. In other words, all-powerful. His understanding no one can fathom. He is omniscient. He's all-knowing. Now, some people might look at the, me using these words and they throw up their hands. You shouldn't use words like that. I, I, I remember once, you know, hearing someone saying, when you preach to a crowd, preach them as though they're 12-year-olds so everyone understands. If you preach so that people are 12, they'll stay at 12, and you'll end up with a congregation of 12-year-olds. Um, I think we should be challenged. We shouldn't be afraid of these words. These are incredible truths. God is everywhere. God knows everywhere everything. God is all-powerful. God is eternal. And one of the other things I love about this is that God is all of these things together. Because if just one of those was missing, that would be potentially dangerous. You imagine someone who is all-powerful, but not all-knowing. I can do everything, but I don't actually know what the best thing is to do, but I'll just go ahead and do it. Terrible. Imagine someone who is all-powerful, but not, uh, sorry, omnipresent. Oh, I know what I need, needs to be done, but I'm not there. I can't do that. Or who's not eternal, you know, who doesn't know the end from the beginning. Uh, all of these things, they all meet together in the person of our God. And I just think that is so good. And that one verse, it just encapsulates all those ideas uh, together. We've also got his supremacy over idols. Now, I was mentioning in uh, the first part of uh, Isaiah, Isaiah warns the people about worshipping idols. But uh, really, in the second part, Isaiah really has a go at the idols and the foolishness, and he mocks them. He really does mock them. So let's read again another passage. First of all, turn to chapter 44, please. Chapter 44, verse 12. Because again, I just love 
the way all of this is phrased. Chapter 44, verse 12. The blacksmith takes a tool and works with it in the coals. He shapes an idol with hammers. He forges it with the might of his arm. He gets hungry and loses his strength. He drinks no water and grows faint. The carpenter measures with a line and makes an outline with a marker. He roughs it out with chisels and marks it with compasses. He shapes it in the form of a man, of man in all his glory, that it may dwell in a shrine. He cut down cedars, or perhaps took a cypress or oak. He let it grow among the trees of the forest, or planted a pine and the rain that made it grow. It is man's fuel for burning. Some of it he takes and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. But he also fashions a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Half of the wood he burns in the fire. Over it he prepares his meal. He roasts his meat and eats his fill. He also warms himself and says, Oh, I am warm. I see the fire. From the rest, he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Save me, you are my god. They know nothing. What a contrast with the omniscient god. They know nothing. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see, and their minds are closed so they cannot understand. No one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of it I use for fire. I even break bread over its coals. I roasted meat and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart misleads him. He cannot self save himself or say, is not this thing in my right hand a lie? So I just love that. I just think it's such a graphic way of explaining the, the stupidity of idolatry. Also in chapter 46, I just say, that, that uh, picture that you've got up there, I've got underneath it the name Nebo. Nebo was one of the Babylonian gods. Um, you know in the Old Testament, sometimes people have got names, well, like Isaiah, Isaiah, uh, he saves Yah, Yahweh, they're named after God. Uh, so Nebuchadnezzar is named after the god Nebo. There's another god called Bel. Um, there was someone called Belshazzar. Um, Daniel himself, Daniel was renamed Belteshazzar when they took him to Babylon. So in chapter 46, if I read from the very beginning, um, when we're talking about Bel and Nebo, these are their gods, or specifically here, the idols. And this is what God says is going to happen when Babylon is falling. It says, Bel bows down. Nebo stoops low. Their idols are borne by beasts of burden. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. What he's talking about is that Babylon is falling, and instead of their gods helping and rescuing them, They've got to help and rescue their God. In actual fact, they're putting them on the back of the donkeys and it's slowing, their gods are slowing them down while they're trying to escape with their gods. So these gods, these idols, they stoop and bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. They themselves go off into captivity. And God draws a contrast. He said, listen to me, O house of Jacob, all you who remain from the house of Israel, you whom I have upheld... Notice that little play on words, you know, I'm the one who's doing the upholding, whom I have upheld since you were conceived and have carried since your birth, even to your old age in gray hairs, I am he. Don't forget that phrase, I am, you know, this name of God, when he uses that phrase, I am he, it's really emphasizing that. I am he, I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. To whom will you compare me or count me equal? You know, and, and so God is just so, so different. Uh, these idols that uh, the people have prayed to, have asked for help, the idols need rescuing. Uh, they're, they're rescuing their gods. God is rescuing his people. Then we've got monotheism. Now get ready. This isn't just monotheism. Some of you don't get too excited, but I want to mention 
philosophical monotheism. Oh, I can, so go, I can see some of you calm down, calm down, all right? <laughs> some of you are thinking, what on earth are you on about? Right? I think we all know what the word monotheism means. It means there's one God, all right? But actually, sometimes people distinguish between what's called practical monotheism. I'll explain this in a minute, it's not too hard. Practical monotheism and philosophical monotheism. Practical monotheism is that we've got one God, don't care about the other gods. Yahweh's our God, we're going to worship him. And you don't really address whether there are other gods. And you find verses in the Bible, and we've actually got some choruses that we ourselves sing. For thou, O Lord, art high, above all the heavens, thou art exalted far above all gods. How many of you have sung that? Yeah, probably all of us. Now, does that mean we believe in other gods? No, we're just saying that God is above all, and it doesn't matter if other people. But some people distinguish between that and what they think was a later sort of development that people thought, well, I'm only concerned about God, couldn't care less about the others to the fact that you actually deny the existence, the possibility of any other God. So um, later on, in, in these chapters, you read these verses, God is able to predict the future, and he's telling his people about what's happening, so that you may know and believe and understand that I am he. Again, if you see those words, I am he, I, I'm Yahweh, you know, this is the name of God. And you get words like this, before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no savior. So all this is, is it's just saying, now we're getting to the place where the people are saying, there is only one God. It's not just that our God is the best God. It's not just that our God is greater, but actually our God is the only God. And uh, all the rest, the blocks of wood or blocks of stone. So I hope, does that all make sense, all right? It's just being explicit about the fact there is no other God. But actually something flows out of that, and I've used this word uh, before about universalism. Uh, can I just say sometimes today it's used that some people think everyone's gonna get saved. I'm not using it in that sense. But that there is one God who is God over all the earth. I, I, I wish I had more time actually to, uh, you know, it'd, it'd be lovely to, uh, to do my Old Testament course, the whole thing again. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pushing for, for this, but you know, I used to have time and I talk about when the people went away into exile, the great danger was that some of them just would abandon their faith and think, we're in exile. Why are we in exile? Because the gods of the Babylonians are obviously bigger than Yahweh. Remember I said before, if your nation beat my nation, it's because your God's bigger than my God. And they might have thought, this is a disaster. We've lost our land. We've lost the temple. Yahweh's been defeated. I'm not going to worship Yahweh. I'm going to worship some of the Babylonian gods. And I'm sure there were some people that did that. But as people began to, when they were taken away to exile, it looks as though they began to focus on their history. What had happened in the past? And one of the things that they discovered is that God had made a covenant that basically said, if you obey me, I'll bless you. If you disobey me, you're in trouble. And they looked back and thought, wow, well, actually that was true. I remember when we took Jericho when we were following God, but then we stopped following him and disobeyed him and we lost the little old AI. Remember when the judges were around, when we were following God, we were enjoying the land. But when we turned away and started worshiping Baal, all these other people attacked us. And so they began to realize that there was a pattern in history that God was blessing. When they turned away from God, they would get judged and God would use Assyria and God would use Babylon. But that means that God is actually in charge of Assyria. God is in charge of Babylon. And so there is this realization that he is not just the only God, but if he's the only God, he must be God over the whole world. And if you look at what has happened, you can actually see his hand in it. That actually Assyria was never under the control of the Assyrian gods, but the Assyria was the rod of God's anger. That Babylon was being used by God. Now God is using Cyrus, the Persians. And so in this part of the Bible, we read about um, 
verses like, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. All peoples together will see it. Remember what Isaiah saw when he saw the angels? It says the glory of the Lord fills the earth. Holy, holy, holy. All people will see it. It talks about someone, and we'll get onto this in a minute, who will bring justice to the nations and light to the Gentiles. Remember what Simeon said to the baby Jesus when he was about to be sort of dedicated? Um, he's going to be a light to the Gentiles. God's plan has always been much bigger than just the Jews. It's always been for the whole world. And so, you know, you get these proclamations as well turn to me and be saved all you ends of the earth for i am god and there is no other and so you know it's one of the reasons i love if, if if i was only allowed to have 16 chapters in the old testament i would take isaiah 40 to, uh, to 55 i think these are, are great chapters let me just talk as well i want to talk about the suffering servant and I want to do this in quite a thorough way because I think sometimes there's one thing in particular that I hope that we will get uh, out of this. Uh, this notion of someone who in these chapters in Isaiah is talked about the servant of God, but he is someone who has to suffer. And the chapter that uh, we all know about is Isaiah 53. Remember right in the very beginning, I asked people, do you know any verses from Isaiah? And lots of people knew Isaiah 53. And quite rightly, we see in it a great prophecy about the Lord Jesus, his life, death, and his resurrection. But scholars who read the book of Isaiah and uh, know the Hebrew and know it far, far better than me, they've also for a long, long time noticed that when you read it, there, there seem to be four passages that seem to be written in a slightly different style. It's a bit more poetic, the style. And so they talk about these poems, although they call them songs, and these are all songs about someone who is called the servant. And uh, as I said here, these describe the ministry and destiny of God's chosen servant. And God's chosen servant is going to encounter opposition and eventually death as well. And as I mentioned, there's four of them. Uh, you'll find them in Isaiah 42, Isaiah 50, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 50, and then Isaiah 53, the poem actually starts with the last few verses of um, Isaiah 52, who is believed our report. Um, uh, can I just say, sometimes when uh, people look at these poems, sometimes people argue over exactly how far they go, so you might see slightly different verses. But I'm just going to give you one verse from each of those um, songs or poems and uh, in chapter 42 God says here is my servant whom I uphold my chosen one in whom I delight I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations now I want to say that is an amazing prophecy about Jesus and actually amazing about his baptism because Remember what God says at his baptism? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, all right? The one in whom I delight. He has his spirit brought upon him. Ah. And I've highlighted the word justice to the nations. In the Old Testament, you often get this idea of God bringing justice. And the problem is when we think about justice, sometimes we think, um, of a sort of legal setting, a forensic setting, you know, a judge in court or something. But the word justice in the Old Testament, it's much bigger than that. I, if you want, in, in very loose terms, it's God's way of doing things. It's God's ideas, God's methods, God's virtues, God's integrity, God's righteousness, all of that. And when it says this person, he's going to bring about God's way of doing things. In other words, he's going to bring about God's rule. Or another way, he's going to bring about God's kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so I would just suggest to you that when you read the word justice in the Old Testament, it's equivalent to what Jesus is coming to bring, the kingdom of God, where God's ways, God's values, God's ethics, um, the morality of God is experienced. Then, in chapter 49, verse 6, God says of this servant, it's too small a thing 
for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. All right? I've got bigger plans, not just Judah and Israel. I, have, uh, 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 I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. And of course, we can see the immediate application of that. So this servant, he's been called by God, he's been anointed by the Spirit to bring God's kingdom, to bring it throughout the whole world. But as the story goes on, he encounters opposition. And in chapter 50, verse 6, you read these astounding verses. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheek to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. And of course, we know that certainly the mocking and the spitting, they're recorded when we come to the account of Jesus' death. Can I just say, the New Testament does not say that Jesus' beard was pulled out. All right, the Gospels do not say that. You might have heard it said, it's because of that prophecy. I mean, it, he, it may have happened, but I'm just saying, if you, if you look it up in the Gospels, you won't find uh, a record of that. And then, um, and then we'll, we'll have the break, if that's okay. You have the break early. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, we know Isaiah 53, right? This one who comes, who experiences opposition, is also going to experience death. He was pierced for our transgressions. Again, what an incredible thing to say. I've mentioned this before. Being pierced, the Jewish way of killing people was stoning. But they couldn't do it in Jesus' day because the Romans were in charge. And the Romans said, if we're going to put someone to death, we're going to do it a different way. We'll use the Roman way, crucifixion. And uh, he's pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. Okay. So quite clearly it is talking about Jesus. But I do want to say that other people have come up with some other ideas. There are one or two other verses that if we're honest to what the scripture says, we've got to take them into account. But actually there is a message for us in there as well. So we'll stop for 10 minutes and have the break now. Okay. Thanks ever so much. The college, which actually is almost 50 years ago. I can't believe that. It's just ridiculous. Um, uh, I remember reading loads of books about this um, because people had all these different ideas and uh, if you speak to Jews in particular, they will have a very different idea. And I just want to mention some of these uh, things and come up with what I think is an interesting thought, all right? Now, um, there was, not nowadays, but in the past, there have been loads and loads of books and articles written all about uh, who the servant is and some people say well you know were they looking forward were they looking at people who were around were they looking back to the past was Isaiah speaking about himself which is an interesting question because if you read remember in Acts chapter 8 Philip comes to the Ethiopian eunuch and the Ethiopian eunuch is reading Isaiah 53 and he reads about this person who's led as a lamb to the slaughter and Philip says do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian Union says, is Isaiah talking about himself or someone else? So he was thinking maybe it was Isaiah. Of course, the great thing is, is one of the versions says, Philip preached Christ to him, you know, so he points out who uh, the lamb is. Um, uh, and the other thing is, is it just one individual or is it a group? And what I'm trying to do here as well is just be totally honest with everything that the Bible says about this because if you do talk to some Jews, they say you're just picking out little bits, you're not looking at the big picture, all right? Now, some people say maybe they looked at uh, uh, some of the historical people who were called servants of God and I've got the references there, Moses. Uh, remember the beginning of Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. God calls him a servant. Joshua is called a servant when he dies as well. Isaiah is called a servant. Jeremiah, Jeremiah isn't called the servant of God in the Bible, but there's some interesting things about Jeremiah's life because he's the weeping prophet, so um, he goes through a lot of difficulties. Hezekiah, some people have suggested Josiah. Josiah was a really, really good king, although he's not called a servant. Zerubbabel later on. He's called the servant of God. So sometimes people have said, you know, were one of these uh, intended at the time? And I think the fact that there's so many, none, none, none of them really fits the bill. 
a lot of people did used to say maybe he was talking about Je Jeremiah. So I said Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. Do you remember all the things? I mean, probably the best known example. He gets thrown down a, a practically empty cistern of water, you know, where there's just mud at the bottom. And really he's left there to die. The people don't want the, his, his enemies who don't like what he's proclaiming, that God is going to use the Babylonians. Uh, they don't want to be guilty of killing him themselves, so they just put him down gently into this cistern and leave him there. But uh, someone called Ebed-Melech is inspired by God and rescues him. But uh, someone who wrote a book, and this, this is about 70 years old, though, but it's an excellent book. Someone called C.R. North says, there are undoubtedly fear, features of Jeremiah in the portrait, but that he was the servant intended by the prophet is impossible to maintain if only because, though he suffered, he did not suffer patiently. He gets a bit fed up sometimes, uh, Jeremiah, with what's happening. Moreover, the servant not only suffered as a consequence of his mission, suffering was the means whereby he was to bring his mission to a successful issue, to a successful end. All right. So people like um, Joshua have been uh, included. Now, as I said, when we've, what we've looked at easily, uh, before, we can say, well, quite clearly, it's Jesus. But there is one verse that sometimes we overlook. And again, this is one that the Jews tend to point out, because in Isaiah 49, verse 3, he said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. So if we're honest, we've got to take this into account. God also calls Israel his servant. And so those who follow Judaism uh, nowadays say these are all prophecies about God's people, the Jews, and about the suffering that they will go through. Now can I just say that, again, this issue of suffering is a really key, important thing. Just as we said, you know, Jeremiah suffered, but he wasn't suffering on behalf of others. Um, in chapter 53, it says he was wounded for our iniquities, bruised for our uh, transgressions. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. So, you know, that's quite clearly suffering for someone else. You might have, sometimes people talk about suffering vicariously. If ever you hear that word when people preach, it just means to suffer on someone else's behalf. And the point is, is that when you read about what happens to Israel and Judah in the Old Testament, when they're suffering, it's because they have disobeyed God. And I won't go through that, but if you read those passages, it is quite clear. God says, I've raised up Assyria because of your sin. Because of your sin, you've been taken away into exile. And also, you have to take into account um, that um, this servant, you know, one of the songs says, it's the one in whom God delights. Well, was God delighted with Israel and Judah? Um, not, not, well, he wasn't, because uh, he had to judge them. So, we get back to this story, uh, to, to, to this interpretation, that it's talking about Jesus of Nazareth. That, 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 those, those verses that I talked about, links to his baptism, links to his suffering, links to his death uh, uh, as well. And also, in the New Testament, I was just talking about Acts chapter 27, who is this one, who is this lamb, one who is led as a lamb to the slaughter? It's Jesus. In 1 Peter, it quotes part of Isaiah 53, where Peter says, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. Now that's interesting, the context this comes in. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. He himself bore our sins in his body, on the tree, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So Peter is quite clearly quoting Isaiah 53 as referring to Jesus. You find the same in Matthew chapter 12. Jesus heals a lot of people. And there's a quotation there. Uh, it, well, Matthew actually quotes all of Isaiah 42 verses 1 to 4 there. In uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 37, this is Jesus talking, all right? Jesus says, it is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors, transgressors, 
And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is written its fulfillment. So Jesus quite clearly says that these verses apply to me. Mark 10 verse 45 is about Jesus giving his life as a ransom as well. But um, there still are one or two problems. Uh, some people say we tend to just focus on Isaiah 53, but I, I think the other um, servant songs clearly talk about Jesus as well. Some people say, well, you're totally ignoring this bit that God calls Israel his servant. And then there's this verse. Who is blind but my servant and deaf like the messenger I send? What? The servant is blind and deaf? This seems to be attributing imperfection to the servant. And all of this is in Isaiah. So I, please, I hope you hear my heart that we, we need to be totally honest and try and work out what is going on. Also, when we come to the New Testament, it is very interesting that they apply Isaiah 49 verse 6 to the early church. Not the bit about dying on behalf of other people, but it says, this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. This is the time in the book of Acts when Gentiles are getting saved and they're having a big conference. Can God save the Gentiles? Should the Gentiles be circumcised? And all these things. And they come up and they say, this is what God said. That so the early church sees itself in a way as the servant. So is there a way of bringing all these things together? I want to go back to that book by C.R. North. And uh, he says, well, I'll read exactly what he says. Christian interpreters are unanimous in that whoever the servant was as the prophet intended to portray him, Jesus crucified and risen alone responds adequately to the picture of his person and work. All right? So it is talking about Jesus. But what about these other things? He mentions uh, an earlier scholar called Franz de Leach, and he had this little diagram, um, as you can see there, of this triangle with Christ at the top and Israel at the bottom. And uh, I haven't spelled all of this out, but what he's saying is that God called Israel to be his servant nation, to bring the word of God, to show what God is like, to be a light to the nations. That's quite clearly there. And sometimes Israel did it. And sometimes there were remarkable individuals. You know, you could draw a line through there and you could say, well, there was Moses, there was Josiah, there was Jeremiah, there were all these people. They were servants of God and they were God's vehicle for bringing the message of the gospel. But they weren't the ones who died. The focus is in Jesus Christ. So he is the servant, if you like, with a capital S. Does that all make sense? So within Israel, there were all, always servants, but some of them didn't do very well. Sometimes Israel didn't do very well. So when God says, my servant is blind and deaf, he's saying, Israel's not listening to me. I've called you. I've called you into service. I've called you into servanthood, but you're not being what you should. But the God's plan always reaches its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. But what C.R. North did, and I, I, I just, this just really sort of appealed to me. He said, actually, we can extend that figure. And what he did, he flipped it first of all on its head and said, you know, let's follow this story through. God is called Israel. Israel is to be a light to the nations. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But out of Israel comes Christ, the servant. But afterwards, remember I said that the early church saw in some of these verses that they applied to the early church. And so what he did was extend that picture and said the Christian church is the heir to that servant vocation, that servant calling in the Old Testament. Hope that makes sense. Right? Jesus is right at the center. Jesus is the servant. Jesus is the only one who can die on behalf of other people. Israel couldn't do it. You and I can't do it. But we are still called to be servants. We're still called to follow that example. We're still called to be a light 
to the nation or a light to the Gentiles to share um, that word. And so, you know, within Israel, within the church, we are called to be servants. But I think that's got an amazing implication as well. And I think that's what really sort of um, stood out. When I read that verse from Peter, it talked about Jesus who suffered. And it talks about us following his example. And it actually, to me, seems to say, this is part of our calling. That sometimes we will suffer. And I, I just find it quite amazing how sometimes there are Christians who say, oh, if there's suffering in your life, oh, something wrong. God doesn't want suffering in your life. I read the Bible, and almost everyone who's following God goes through difficulties. You know, Joseph, he's checked in jail and uh, totally unbelieved. Daniel, he's thrown in a lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they go in a furnace. The disciples, they have to suffer. Well, they, they do suffer. Now, I'm not saying that we should develop a martyr complex because you do meet people who go to the other extreme who are always sort of suffering. God wants us to enjoy life as well. He said, you know, I'm come that they may have life in all its fullness. But actually, the notion that suffering is part of what we go through is amazing. And uh, you know, I could spend a lot of time just talking on suffering. God does things when we're suffering. One of the things, in one of the books by C. I think it's C.S. Lewis, in, in, it might be in The Problem of Pain, it's got a great um, line, I, uh, excuse me if I don't quote it exactly, it said, suffering is one of the things that are lent to us. Joy is given, joy will be our everlasting inheritance. But in this lifetime, we suffer and we learn from suffering. And that to me, you know, these things are really quite liberating to me, uh, as I say, without wanting to develop a, 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 martyr, a, 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 martyr, a martyr complex. And that uh, God calls us to follow in the steps of Jesus, and sometimes that means it is hard. But ultimately, of course, the suffering will one day be over once and for all. But in the meantime, when I go through those dark situations, rather than rebel against God or rebel against other people, you know, and, and uh, everything, sometimes I think, what is it that God's trying to tell me? So, can I to just say, that doesn't mean everything that goes wrong, you know, is a message from God. The fact that you knocked your cup of coffee over this morning is not a message from God. It just means you're clumsy, all right? You know, so don't, but you get the idea about... Uh, suffering so I, I hope that helps you I know that seems a little bit long and a bit complicated but I hope there might be something in there for you to uh, understand just to say when I was in college sometimes I would ask the students in the exam to write on one verse because that verse to, to me sums up the whole message of Isaiah up to that time leave Babylon you've been in exile you've been punished free from the Babylons, announce this with shouts of joy, proclaim it, there is salvation. Send it out to the ends of the earth, because our God is this universal God. He is the only God, the God for everyone. Say, the Lord has redeemed all those ideas to do with the redemption. He's in relationship with us. He frees us, he sets us free. He's redeemed his servant. He's called a servant. We've got the benefit of hindsight. We look to the servant of the Lord, but we follow in his footsteps. Ever so quickly, I do just want to say a little bit about the date and the authorship of um, Isaiah. Can I just ask, have any of you ever heard people refer to part of Isaiah as Deutero-Isaiah? Have any of you? Oh no, or Trito-Isaiah? Oh, well, yeah, Jim has. You see, when you read some commentaries, if you read some commentaries, they actually say that Isaiah wasn't just one book, but it was a trilogy. A bit like I was going to have the, the music to Star Wars. Um, uh, of course, at Star Wars, there's nine episodes now, a trilogy of trilogies, but uh, I was young enough to remember when Star Wars came out, first of all, then The Empire Strikes Back, then Return of the Jedi, and those are the first three, and then there, there wasn't anything else made. Um, other trilogies that we might know lord of the rings okay some of you you might have a one volume book of the lord of the rings 
if you drop it on your foot, you'll break your foot. But uh, they actually, back in the 1950s, released the Fellowship of the Ring, the Two Towers, the Return of the King. And of course, people are probably more familiar with Peter Jackson's films of uh, that same name. But some people think that Isaiah was a trilogy made up of three parts. And the book that we have got in our Bible was made up of these three parts. Now, this what was never a problem for centuries. Everyone just assumed that the whole book was written by Isaiah of Jerusalem, you know, around about 700. You know, he was alive from 750 to probably gone 700. But Isaiah of Jerusalem, or Isaiah the son, Isaiah ben Amos, he wrote the whole book. But back in the 18th century, a um, uh, lot of critical thought, and uh, someone called Dodderline said, hold on, when I read this book, the first half is all about the Assyrians. The second half is about the Babylonians. That wasn't until much later. It must have been written by someone much, much later. Maybe there was a group of disciples. In actual fact, in the book of Isaiah, you do read about his disciples, um, you know, a group who, who followed him. And they think that this was written during the exile because it's so accurate. Of course, they've got a different set of thinking to uh, us. And uh, just over a century later, some other people said, well, hold on, when I read chapters 40 uh, uh, to, and later on, 40 to 55 is to do with the exile. The other bits, even later, it's when they, not just at the end of the exile, when they've come back home. And so when you read some books, and really this is just to tell you that these titles do occur. They call chapters 1 to 39 proto-Isaiah. Proto means first, first Isaiah. 40 to 55 is deutero. Deutero means second. Do you remember Deuteronomy? Remember what that means? The second law? Because the generation who had been at Mount Sinai had died. A new generation is going to go back in to the promised land. So Moses goes over the law a second time. Deutero-Isaiah. And there's trito-Isaiah. So I just want to give you a sense of how some other people approach this. Um, so there's three main reasons. Some people say, well, when you read the history, it's quite clear it's talking about different times, different periods. Uh, in such detail, people must have been alive then. When you read the different parts, they're written in different styles. And also, when you read the different parts, there's different theology that's going on. And so these are what they argue. So just first of all, to look at their arguments. Um, back to my little diagram there. What you find is that when Isaiah of Jerusalem is around in chapters 1 to 39, it mentions King Isaiah. So we know this is 742. So this is the 8th century BC. It's mentioned in Assyria. And uh, again, hope you remember, Assyria are the ones that are threatening. They're the big nation that are around there. So... You know, that all fits in. But when we start reading later, it seems as though it's talking about the end of the exile in Babylon. And it certainly mentions Babylon umpteen times. Well, back in Isaiah's day, Babylon wasn't this big threat. You know, so why are they talking about Babylon? And even more astounding, it mentions Cyrus, who's going to come along, and Cyrus is going to destroy Babylon. Surely it was someone who was alive at that time. And then those that argue the very last bit, they say in this last bit, they do tend to make a lot of fuss about the Sabbath, although they're not, they, that's not the only bit. Can I just say, um, towards the end of the Old Testament, the Sabbath became more and more important. I could tell you a lot more about this, but remember when you come to Jesus' day? By the time you come to Jesus' day, what can you do on the Sabbath? Well, Jesus, sorry, you can't heal. Anyone, you know, they were getting more and more fussy about the Sabbath. And, you know, references to the repairer of broken walls. This means that they're not just getting ready to go home, but they're getting home. And they're finding that there are all these ruins that need to be sorted out. So they say that, you know, there's different history. They say there's different style and different language. The first half, woe to you. Remember? Because it's talking about judgment, but judgment that's still to come. In the second half, there's comfort. Judgment is past, and the temple needs to be rebuilt. They also say, uh, uh, you know, it's not just the language, but the actual style it's written in. So in chapter 10, it just says, woe to the Assyrian. Quite short, quite blunt. Whereas, you, I hope you remember this 
um, last, last week I was reading this description about the virgin daughter. Go down, sit in the dust, virgin daughter of Babylon, you wanton creature lounging in your security. And they say the second half, it's much more poetic, all right? It's written in a different style. It must be a different author. Oh, I, I, I won't, if anyone wants, looks in the notes, I can, go, I can go over that again. They say in the first half of Isaiah is that practical monotheism, where, you know, they're talking about worshipping God. You are my God, I'll exalt you. But it's only in the second half that you get, remember that philosophical monotheism? Don't get too excited again now. Um, before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no saviour. So they say that because of these differences, they must have been written by different people. Um, oh, sorry, I'd forgotten about this, this last one. In the first part of the book, it constantly on about the Messiah. Someone from Jesse's uh, family, from David's family, someone who's going to come and redeem uh, Israel. Whereas in the second part, they constantly talk about the servant, someone who is going to die. Um, right, let me just talk about the unity of Isaiah. And what I want to do is just very quickly mention those bits about history, about style, about theology. And then talk about internal evidence. Internal evidence means what do we know about what the Bible says? What does the Bible say? And also external evidence. Is there any external evidence to suggest that uh, the book was written by more than one person? So just in terms of history, I say back to this chart that I've used loads. When we get to Isaiah chapters 40 to 55, it's talking about this period in time. How can Isaiah, living there, talk about that? Well, because... If there is a God who is eternal and omniscient, there is the possibility of predictive prophecy. All right? Uh, lots of these people, they, they'd say, oh, you can't do that. The, the, how could these prophets do it? Because God is God. Because Isaiah knew God. So all of a sudden, there is this possibility. And in actual fact, when you look very carefully, when they say, oh, no, I, I, Isaiah wouldn't have known about that. When you go back, right at the very beginning, in Isaiah chapter 5, in that first part, he says, my people will go into exile. So he is prophesying about an exile. Isaiah chapter 9, in the future he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles. Do you remember that was talking? It goes on to say about this, unto us a son is born, and, uh, 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 unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. He's talking about Jesus who's going to minister in Galilee. In Isaiah 13, it does mention Babylon, the jewel of the kingdoms. The glory of the Babylonians' pride will be overthrown by God. So if you look carefully enough, there are plenty of prophecies there. And one of the things that I find really most astounding is that they're having this go at the second part of Isaiah. And the second part of Isaiah, it starts off, and it is constantly saying words like this, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Right? That Isaiah is saying, this is what God's saying. I've told you all about this. This is proof of the fact that I am omniscient, that I am omnipotent, that I am eternal, that I am omnipresent because I'm in control of all the earth. So, you know, that argument just doesn't hold any water. Uh, then there is style. Subject matter affects style. It depends who you're writing to. Uh, I know people don't write now, they send emails, but uh, you know, every so often I might send an email to Jim. Uh, if I'm ever away from home, I send an email to Lynn. Can I just tell you that the content of those emails are radically different? <laughs> okay, because it depends on the situation. So if Israel is sinning and Isaiah is having to say, stop sinning, that's very different from saying, look, God's just about to rescue us. We're about to go home. This is great news. God is on the move. In actual fact, there's a lot of similarity. As you read through the book, I mentioned that phrase, the Holy One of Israel. Twelve times in the first 39 chapters, 13 times. You know, it's spread right the way throughout the book. 
you also find that God's comfort is mentioned, beginning of chapter 12, beginning of chapter 14. So again, these things are right the way throughout the book. Back in the first half of Isaiah, you get this idea of what we call philosophical monotheism. O oh, Lord Almighty, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. And as for that argument, in the first part, it's talking about the Messiah. In the second part, it's talking about the suffering servant. Praise God, we know that the Messiah was the suffering servant. You know, the, all right, the Jews weren't expecting that. They were just looking for a king. But Jesus was constantly telling them, I'm fulfilling scripture, but the son of man must suffer, must be handed over, but he will rise after three days. Just regarding what the Bible says, I mean, it is interesting when you read the prophetic books, they all start off and say, this is the word, this is the burden, this is the message of so-and-so at the beginning. And someone is named at the beginning. Isaiah is named at the beginning of this book. There's no new name at Isaiah chapter 40. There's no new name at Isaiah 56. It is all put together. And actually, if you've got your Bibles, if you can just turn to John chapter 12, verse 38. John chapter 12, verse 38. I'll just read this out, right? Um, John chapter 12. Oh, let me read from verse 37. John chapter 12. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, if you've got um, a Bible with footnotes there, or you might even recognize it. That's Isaiah 53 verse 1. All right? So a part of Isaiah that's supposed to be in the second bit of half John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, carries on writing, for this reason they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he's blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts. They can neither see with their eyes or understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Where's that from? Isaiah chapter 6. So as far as John's concerned, he's saying, look, we read all about this, in the book of Isaiah. And whether it comes to Isaiah chapter 53 or Isaiah chapter 6, this is what Isaiah has said. And so the Bible's testimony is quite clear. Finally, um, external evidence. Is there any external evidence? Back in 1947, a little Arab boy was at a place near Qumran, the Dead Sea, by the Dead Sea, and uh, he threw a stone, he was trying to get uh, some of his sheep, and it went into a cave, made a funny noise, went out and began to explore, and began to find there were all these pots there with all these different manuscripts. The very best manuscript was the manuscript of Isaiah. This is about 25 feet long, eight meters, eight yards feet long when it's unrolled. I don't know if any of you have been to Israel, but if you go to Israel, there is a museum, the Dead Sea Scrolls Museum. Yeah, and it, it looks like a pot. It's, it, it's actually shaped like the whole structure is shaped like a pot, like the pots that they found. When I went there years and years ago, they had, the, did you see this? Because they, they, they used to have it all laid out behind glass. Oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah. So um, there's this Isaiah scroll. They reckon this was written down about 150 BC. So this was much, much older than many of the New Testament and Old Testament manuscripts that we had. So it's, it's by far the oldest actual copy we've got of Isaiah. And uh, I've got the actual details there. Chapter 39 ends one line from the bottom of a of a column containing Isaiah 38 verse 8 to 40 verse 2. There's just a little bit of space there to fill up 
the letters, but I, I wish I'd been there. I wish someone had filmed it, because people had come up with all these ideas, and then in 1947, they found this scroll, and as they were unrolling it, what they expected to find. And what do you find between Isaiah chapter 39 and Isaiah 40? Absolutely nothing. It just carries on. And on some of these manuscripts, when they wanted to make a note of something, they'd put something in the margin, you know, that might say, this is where Deutero Isaiah starts. There is no evidence whatsoever for saying that the book of Isaiah was written at different times. The Bible testifies that it was written 700 years before Jesus, uh, about 200 years before Babylon came. Uh, as I said, 700 years before all these amazing prophecies about the Lord Jesus was written. So I just want to encourage you that even if you read some of these arguments that people say you can't trust the Bible, yes, you can. Okay. So I hope that helps. I've, uh, sorry, I've, I've taken a little bit long. I was hoping to finish a little bit earlier. Um, again, all the notes are there. Please have a read through. And I hope that it just inspires you that when you turn to the book of Isaiah, spend some time thinking about it. Read some of it out loud. Uh, in, you know, enjoy what God has done through his prophet. Let me just pray. Father, just want to commit all of this. We've spoken about loads and loads of things. Uh, we know that we can't uh, remember all of them but once again i just pray that you would bring about those moments of inspiration that you would set those seeds in our hearts that they would just grow and that they would inspire us uh, thank you for these incredible prophecies thank you that jesus is the suffering servant of god but also lord i thank you that we are called to share in your mission to proclaim that we have got an eternal god an omniscient god an omnipotent god an omnipresent god the god who is the god of the world who has shown himself through jesus christ and wants to save everyone who uh, is a light to the nations a light to the gentiles amen amen okay thank you Thanks, Thank you so much.